to account. We'll tackle these issues with our experts in a moment, but first, this report... Good afternoon, Earth. This is Adam Sturch broadcasting from the Mushroom Mansion, Taos, New Mexico, working on oil painting distressed hue. All right, now the next step on this is a little bit tricky. So, I got the aura set in, and I'm going to use the same color for a series of faces that will be extending out from the aura and interlocking eyes, mouth is the next set of eyes to the mouth, is the next set of eyes to the mouth. So, um, and then there will all be eyes, uh, no mouths, even though some of them will have kind of lippish uh, eyelids, I suppose. And then uh, that will follow the contour of this swirl that leads up into the uh, depth or the height of the, of the picture plane. But it chooses not to. The U.S.'s deadline expired on Tuesday, but Washington says Israel has made some progress and it won't take any action against its ally. We at this time have not made an assessment that there. Uh, that the Israelis are in violation of U.S. law. Uh, but most importantly, we are going to continue to watch uh, how these steps that they've taken, how they are being implemented. This assessment by the U.S., Israel's largest provider of weapons, is in spite of international aid agencies declaring that Israel has failed to increase humanitarian access to Gaza. After 13 months of war, almost the entire population of 2.3 million Palestinians is relying on aid for survival. In northern Gaza, food security experts and rights groups warn famine is imminent. And Human Rights Watch is accusing Israeli forces of committing war crimes by forcibly displacing more than 90% of Gaza's population. The US Secretary of State says he's deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza He's urging Israel to end its war, having, in his words, accomplished its military goals. It was rightly determined to uh, make sure, to the best of its ability, that October 7th could never happen again. And to do that, it said that it needed to dismantle the military organization of Hamas and to get the leadership that was responsible for October 7th. It's done both of those things. So, this should be a time to end the war. The UN is struggling to get aid to Palestinians in large part because of Israel's restrictions. Humanitarian groups say Israeli forces have killed at least 20 aid workers in Gaza in the past month. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Cairo. Tamara al spokesperson for UNRWA. In Doha. Hassan Barari, Professor of International Affairs at Qatar University. And in London, Nadia Hardman, researcher in the Refugee and Migrant Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. A very warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Tamara, let me start with you today. The UN Special Committee to Investigate Israeli Practices has issued a report saying that Israel's warfare in Gaza is consistent with the characteristics of genocide with mass civilian and life-threatening conditions intentionally imposed on Palestinians there. That's what the report says. It also goes into details about how the extensive bombing campaign in Gaza has decimated essential services and unleashed an environmental catastrophe that will have lasting health impacts. I want to ask you, how consistent are these findings with what UNRWA has seen on the ground in Gaza? UNRWA is and has been since the beginning of this conflict the largest humanitarian agency in Gaza, and consequently, it has eyes and ears within the Palestine, the Palestinian community in Gaza, most of which has indeed been forcibly displaced repeatedly, on average sometimes once a month, for 90% of the population under the bombing, under the strikes, uh, during uh, an increased uh, food insecurity that amounts to famine, we have long warned that nowhere is placed, no, no, nowhere is safe in Gaza. No one is safe, and increasingly the population has been has been made hungry, has not had access to adequate humanitarian and medical care. So everything we've been reporting on for the last year comes boils down to a population that is extremely scared, heavily displaced, and hungry today. 
Tamara, I want to also ask another question with regard to this uh, UN Special Committee report. Uh, it talks about the ongoing smear campaign and other attacks against UNRWA and the UN at large. It says this deliberate silencing of reporting combined with disinformation and attacks on humanitarian workers is a clear strategy to undermine the vital work of the UN, sever the lifeline of aid still reaching Gaza, and dismantle the international legal order. My question to you, what have the ramifications of all this been for your aid workers there and your colleagues? I want to say that to date, 246 of my colleagues have been killed in Gaza during this war over this last year. I also want to confirm that since the beginning of this war, and uh, uh, an anti-UNRWA campaign primarily rolled out through social media, um, regularly quoting senior Israeli officials, but also lobby groups and some very biased uh, journalists and detractors have sought to discredit the UN at large, especially parts of the UN that report on uh, human human rights and humanitarian law violations. UNRWA has been particularly um, targeted by this disinformation and misinformation campaign. We have been surrounded by claims that have not been substantiated. And we have taken all of the allegations extremely seriously because as a UN agency, we really, really strive for an impeccable adherence to the humanitarian right, principles. But the result that, is, right. once we uh, become that. the target of a, a PR a campaign, um, some of our partners, governments, donors, um, retract their political and their financial support. So for an agency that is still the largest in Gaza and that still runs schools for Palestine refugee children across the region, we cannot afford such a quick reaction by governments, by the donors, by uh, over often unsubstantiated claims that are purely out of politicization. Uh, Nadia, Human Rights Watch has a new report out today. It accuses Israeli forces of committing war crimes by forcibly displacing more than 90% of Gaza's population. Your report also states the following. The organized forced displacement of Palestinians in Gaza has removed much of the Palestinian population from land and specific areas of Gaza that for decades and generations have been their home. You believe that the intention of the Israeli army is essentially to ensure that these areas remain permanently empty and that this is evidence of ethnic cleansing, correct? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that summary. Um, I mean, essentially, the, the report also finds evidence of uh, crimes against humanity. Um, I think that's important to highlight that we have found multiple acts of forced displacement throughout this conflict that continue to this day, and that because of the systematic nature, because it is underlined by state policy, Israeli state policy, it amounts to a crime against humanity. And we're uh, recommending that the ICC's prosecutor also investigate forced displacement as a crime against humanity and the prevention of the right to return. I mean, this report essentially debunks and unpacks Israel's claim that it is evacuating people safely. We go through the laws of war on forced displacement and demonstrate how the conditions to evacuate people lawfully have not been met, have been flagrantly breached. Evacuation orders have been um, issued inconsistently, full of errors, uh, while areas were under attack, you know, there have been attacks on uh, safe zones, we verified them, as well as um, attacks on evacuation routes. The humanitarian situation, an occupying power can only evacuate people if it adheres to strict conditions. People must be allowed to access food, water, shelter, hygiene. Um, and instead, we know that Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war. Um, the humanitarian aid, as your coverage has already highlighted, is woefully inadequate to meet the needs of the population. And this is by intention. Um, and lastly, perhaps more importantly, an occupying power is required to facilitate the return of people once the hostilities have ended from the areas in which they were evacuated from. And instead, what we've seen is the widespread destruction across Gaza and in areas intentionally done so, where Israeli forces have taken control of the area and implemented controlled demolitions 
raising and bulldozing. And nowhere can we see this more clearly than the buffer zones and security corridors where we see that Palestinians have been ethnically cleansed from these areas. Nadia, I'm glad you brought up the issue of evacuation orders because that is something I wanted to ask you more specifically about. You know, we hear a lot about how Israel continues to issue these forced evacuation orders. And you mentioned in your report that Article 49 of the Geneva Convention states that civilians should be moved in safety. That the goal of an evacuation system during wartime is to protect civilians from the dangers of conflict. Based on your research and what you've told me in your previous answer, that's just never been the case in Gaza, right? Exactly. And, you know, what we've done at Human Rights Watch and, you know, why it's taken us so long to put all this evidence together is because we've analysed the evacuation system. We analysed 184 evacuation orders across different platforms to really understand the way in which information was being disseminated or not disseminated. Um, I spoke to a woman who used the interactive block grid um, to check whether her block was safe or whether she would leave that area. And instead, um, you know, it was, it was marked as safe and not slated for evacuation. Later that day, there was an attack. Um, you know, luckily she survived, but her relative's building and her own building were, were damaged and destroyed in this attack. How can people rely on a system that doesn't, it doesn't fit its purpose? And so right now with the military offensive in North Gaza, of course these concerns remain because we are seeing again these evacuation orders where nowhere is safe to go. People continuously have to move. Areas are declared combat zones one day, safe areas another. al Mawasi humanitarian zone that Israel keeps on telling people to go to has changed its boundaries at least 14 times during this conflict. Hassan, I want to look at a different aspect to all this, which is, of course, the U.S.'s continuing steadfast support of Israel and how that's impacting all of this. Uh, last month, the U.S. government gave Israel 30 days to increase the amount of aid going into Gaza or risk losing military support for the war. That U.S. deadline expired on Tuesday, but Washington says Israel has made some progress and that it won't take any action likely against its ally going forward. From your perspective, was Israel during this time at all concerned that the U.S. Um, would actually pull military aid, that Israel might actually face ramifications for not getting more aid into Gaza, or did they just feel comfortable to continue waging the war the way that they've been doing? Well, thank you, Mama, for this uh, very important question. I think the Israeli government uh, never took the American uh, demand seriously. And um, Netanyahu himself was um, saying in one of his interviews that he was the only one in Israel who would uh, manipulate the American administrations um, in a way that would serve the Israeli interests. Um, so we've seen this before, you know, all of these nice words coming from uh, Biden's and Blinken uh, about the war in Gaza, about the need to stop the war, about the need to have uh, humanita humanitarian aid uh, reaching those in need. But when it comes to action, uh, you know, the Americans have never thrown up in their uh, what can even uh, their impetus threat to the Israelis. And for this reason, the Israelis uh, continue the war as, uh, as usual. And here, there's one thing that we have to take this in the, in the context of the American domestic politics. The Israelis realized that uh, Biden was in somehow lame duck president. Uh, he uh, is not in any position to impose anything in Israel. Uh, and that thing was just buying time. So it was, you know, every time he talks to Biden, he would always say the nice thing that he was uh, willing to end the war. It provided that the Israeli conditions are met. But at the same time, uh, he's doing everything possible to undermine even the chances of breaching ceasefire. Uh, because his objectives are not aligned with those uh, of the international community, um, namely stopping the war and even exchange of prisoners. Hassan, let me also ask you about the fact that uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, um, just in the past couple of days, he's urged Israel once again to end the war on Gaza. He said that Israel had accomplished its military goals. Um, but the fact of the matter is that Blinken traveled to Israel 11 times since October 7, 2023, and most of those diplomatic missions ended in failure. Does Blinken really think, especially now that Biden is leaving office and that Trump has been elected again, does, does Blinken really believe now that he actually has leverage? 
I, I don't think that he uh, genuinely believes that he can make any difference in what is taking place right now. But this is his job, is you know, to say this and come to the region and try to uh, iron out the differences between different parties. But I think deep down he knows uh, that he can't make any, any difference simply because the Israelis uh, are unwilling to stop the war. Uh, it's not about the objectives of the war. We don't know what, what the objectives uh, of the war are, actually. He talked about um, releasing the hostages. It's possible in a deal. He is not oh, into that. He wants to, I think, uh, change the status quo in, uh, in, in, in Palestine, in particular in Gaza. Um, he is trying to resettle the north of Gaza. He is trying to even force expulsions on the Palestinians. But because I think the objectives of the war um, have been changing all the time, it, you know, depending on what is taking place on, on the ground. Um, and letting you understand that uh, Blinken uh, is, is not the guy who would make the difference. He's not the guy who would really uh, um, uh, put the pressure on, on the Israelis. Every time he comes uh, to the region, he uh, identifies with the Israeli claims uh, and, 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 and demands. Uh, uh, so we've seen this before. Uh, so I think what Blinken is doing right now is just doing his job, is waiting for um, January 20th, uh, to, um, you know, go home. Nadia, the Human Rights Watch report urges the international community, international actors to do more, to apply pressure on Israel to stop all of this. Um, but that just hasn't been happening. I mean, what needs to happen from your perspective in order to end the war, in order to end all of this violence? The collapse of capitalism. I mean, we need to see, I mean, public condemnation um, immediately of these war crimes that amount to a crime against humanity. I mean, but, you know, meaningful action um, would be felt in the forms of uh, an immediate cessation or a suspension of military assistance and weapons, transfer, tra weapons transfers, and if it comes to it, bilateral agreements. Um, you know, as, as you were talking about this uh, one-month deadline that has passed that Biden's administration gave, um, it passes and there's no consequence. So what kind of message does that set out? Um, we need to focus on what can be done urgently and you know, the threat of suspension of military assistance really might actually tangibly mean something. Um, of course, we'd like to see the, the investigation at the International Criminal Court progress and we're calling on the prosecutor to also investigate forced, um, forced displacement as, and the prevention of the right to return. Um, but really, the kind of message that I think will be felt would be the suspension of military assistance. Tamara, um, eight organizations say the situation in Gaza has only deteriorated since the U.S. set that deadline last month. How difficult is it currently getting aid into Gaza? How much of that is due to Israeli restrictions? And, and currently, what are the logistics like? What are the challenges? Getting aid into Gaza is excruciatingly difficult for my own colleagues at UNRWA and especially for my colleagues vis-a-vis -vis and in the face of a population that has been deprived of safety, of food, of clean drinking water, of medicines, of tents, of tarpaulins, of winter clothes. It is extremely difficult to be an aid worker in Gaza and feel responsible and feel completely handcuffed. The uh, aid going into Gaza has been going in by the trickle. So with only one or two border crossings open and very cumbersome logistics for screening, for checking what's in the convoys, it takes forever to get any aid in. Also, once the aid is in on the Gaza side of the border crossing, there has been increased lawlessness, chaos, primarily driven by people feeling hungry and desperate. And therefore, there's also now lack of safety for the aid uh, convoys, the drivers, and the people who are in charge of receiving the aid and taking it to warehouses and to shelters. Having said that, the primary reason for the very acute humanitarian situation is the extremely stringent high restrictions on the access of aid. Aid has been weaponized during this conflict. People in Gaza have been choked out of receiving food, receiving medicine, and receiving basic services. And even when they tried to shelter inside a UN building seeking the protection of the UN flag, 
many of these buildings, including UNRWA shelters, have been hit, killing people inside them. Nadia, I saw you reacting just now to what Tamara was saying. It looked like you wanted to jump in, so go ahead if you'd like to. No, I was just, you know, thinking about these protections that, you know, are part of this law on forced displacement. You know, basically, if you evacuate a population, you have to provide for that population. So the idea that the Israeli authorities are saying it is not forcibly displacing, it is evacuating people safely, is just, you know, quite overwhelming listening to, you know, the situation for people on the ground. To get humanitarian aid in should never be this difficult. People are starving. All they want is food and water and survival. And it's possible, but it is being willfully blocked. Hassan, there's a lot of speculation right now as to what the next steps will be now that Donald Trump has been reelected and will be returning to the White House come January. Some believe that Netanyahu, Israel's prime minister, might be willing to end the war in Gaza as a gesture to Trump, who in the past has indicated he'd like to see that war wind down. My question to you, number one, is do you expect that to happen? And number two, if that were to happen, would that actually be an end to the war, or would it just be Israel saying the war is ended and essentially doing what is most favorable for Israel going forward? I want to thank you, Mohammed. I mean, I don't have the crystal ball, so I can't really predict what's going to happen in uh, in months to come. But um, there's one thing that is certain: uh, that Nanya has the vested interest in uh, perpetuating the misery of the Palestinians and perpetuating the war, uh, because he wants to reach the point where the Israelis acknowledge that he has won the war uh, squarely. Uh, until this moment, there are a lot of uh, Israelis who think that he has failed simply because the prisoners are still. Um, in the hands of the resistance movement. Um, and more, more Israelis are actually realizing that the only way to get them back is by signing a deal, a deal with Hamas, of course. Uh, so signing a deal would be, um, can bring the end of the war, but uh, Netanyahu wouldn't claim a victory that he is looking for. Uh, and we know that if the war comes to an end, probably uh, tough questions would be raised in Israel that Netanyahu would, would not be uh, able to answer and this will bring him to the even closer uh, to the investigations and the court cases against him and makes his life really a tough one. Uh, so he is actually buying time. Uh, but the thing here is that, you know, the phone call between him and, and, and uh, Trump, when Trump said that he wants to have an end of the war before he uh, before his inauguration, um, probably Netanyahu would uh, comply with that, but he would keep his options open. Um, he, would, he would not declare the end of the war. Uh, even if he reached a settlement with the with, with Hamas, he would only uh, uh, probably looking for excuses to renew this round of fighting with the Palestinians. Uh, but the thing that he can do, I think, is is Lebanon. I think he is more into leaning into uh, reaching a deal with Lebanon, and he, um, uh, he knows that Biden is somehow uh, leaning into that because uh, one of his assignment roles is Lebanese, mm -hmm. and, and he promised him the war in Lebanon, uh, and uh, the the uh, uh, a deal in, in Lebanon is achievable and doable, by the way, even mm -hmm. given what, what, what has taken place over the last month. Um, and there is a way of having uh, trades off between the Lebanese government mm -hmm. and the Israelis. The, the situation is totally different in Gaza. I think the Israelis have messianic mission in Gaza. Um, the right wing in Israel want to continue the war until they achieve victory, and the definition of victory is the total destruction of the Palestinians. Unless there is a pressure on the part of the international community, I didn't think that Netanyahu was going to stop in, in uh, the coming two months and in, in, in the two months to come. Tamara, after 13 months of war, almost the entire population of around 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza is relying on aid for survival. We know that the situation is extremely dire. I want to ask you about this law that was passed by Israel's parliament that's going to bar UNRWA's operations going forward. How much worse? Might that make the already catastrophic situation in Gaza? What does that mean for the population there? I'm glad you're bringing this up because the passing of the two laws that ban UNRWA from working, and I quote, in territory under Israeli sovereignty, end of quote, 
are unprecedented. All right, I don't think I'll be able to get any more done right now. There's only a few minutes left on this uh, memory segment. So, I guess I'll um, detach my camera. I can do that without dangling the strap on the knob. There we go. I'll show you what I did so far. All right, so as you can see, <coughs> if you didn't catch the drift of what I was trying to say, uh, is so that each set of eyes will make a face that makes another, that another mouth, which is the next set of eyes, which makes a face. And that will lock around Napa, this way and then go like this. And what I'll probably end up doing is flipping the canvas so I can work on it uh, it's right side up uh, as I bend the, the face, interlocking face mouth things uh, around the composition. Uh, and then I will color them, uh, shade them, shatter them, uh, and uh, make all of the eye mouths probably pitch black, which would be pretty nice and uh, con uh, have a nice high contrast. Uh, but that's it for the moment. Uh, that's Adam Sturge Broadcasting from the Mushroom Mansion, Taos, Mexico, working on oil painting uh, distressed you. Have a good day, Earth. We are in a situation where the international humanitarian system is mobilized and the multilateral system, the UN General Assembly, the, the International Court of Justice, the different rapporteurs on different rights are all mobilized. This is probably